I'm Larue Pollard from the Department of Journalism and Mass Communication. Welcome to the Midpoint, our third speaker, third topic of Mass Media Week. We've had a basic purpose this week, to take a look at why we as viewers, listeners, and readers get the information that we do from our television watching, our radio listening, and our newspaper reading. The connecting strand, as, we, as I see it, is decision making. The selection of what stories will be aired or published by the different media the selection of news. Our speaker tonight is just such a decision maker. His job is to manage the setting of the, uh, the guidelines for deciding just what stories, what events or developments you hear about each evening from Howard K. Smith and Harry Reasoner. Richard Richter is executive producer of the ABC Evening News. Executive producers have the responsibility for that half hour package of information that we tune into every evening. Mr. Richter acquired that level of news judgment responsibility just last May. He had been a producer for, NBC, for ABC News, I'm sorry, wow. <laughs> he had been a producer for ABC News since 1969. Earlier, he was executive producer for Public Broadcasting Labor Laboratory, a widely acclaimed magazine format news program. Other journalistic experiences that he had were as a writer or producer for other network news programs and documentaries. In the midst of all this were four years on uh, Shriver's Peace Corps staff evaluating programs in African countries. And he had an early career, seven years, with newspapers. So Mr. Richter has had accumulating responsibilities in decision making. He's been asked to discuss tonight how that responsibility is expressed in daily national news program production. Dick? <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I figure that uh, with all of that accumulated experience that I have, I should tell you that I am really 75 years old, and uh, even though I don't quite look it. About two years ago, I guess it was, there was a dam that burst in Buffalo Creek, West Virginia. And the waters swept down and swept away a lot of houses, a lot of people, a lot of structures, bridges, and things. I forget what the death toll was. It was many score of people dead, probably about 100 people dead. I don't remember exactly. As it is with all such stories, uh, we in the news business have to respond to them and send people out to cover them. This particular story, we sent a camera crew, a correspondent, and a producer from Chicago the producer was Terry Corey, the correspondent was Jim Kincaid, the cameraman name was Braddock, John Braddock. They went in there, did some of the basic coverage the first few days. Then they realized that something was, was wrong, that somebody seemed to be not letting them get at the story. I was in Washington one, one day when I got a call from Corey, the producer. It was about 2.30 in the morning. And he said, Dick, we have a problem, and we don't know exactly what to do, with it, do about it. We know what we want to do, but we don't know whether we should do it or not. He said that the governor won't let anybody get near the dam site. We want to go near the dam site because we figure that something is wrong up there and that they're trying to hide something from us. And what the governor has arranged for the next morning, Terry Corey said to me, is a press tour where everybody's going to load up in a bus and the governor and the state police will take people up there, but you won't be able to get beyond a certain roped off area. And Terry said to me, I know that this is not going to produce a story other than the one that the governor wants us to see. And he said to me, I don't want to do that. And I said, well, don't, then don't. And he said, well, CBS and NBC are going to be there. And I said, OK, fine, let them be there. I said, I don't, I don't care if they're there. If it's a story that we shouldn't have because it's a false story, a phony story, one that, that isn't one that you can look at with some integrity, I said, we, we don't want that, that kind of a story. I didn't realize at the time, actually, it seemed to me to be a very easy decision to make. And Terry and Jim and the camera crew 
did not get on the bus, they did not go on and, and uh, get the story that day. They had some other story. I don't even remember the nature of that particular story they had the next day. But from that moment on, Jim Kincaid and Terry Corey and their camera crew became marked men in West Virginia. A couple days later, they were walking, uh, walking up a hillside trying to get close to another slag heap, which was similar to the one that gave way and killed all those poor people in, in West Virginia, when they were followed by some armed men who worked for a coal company, one of these coal companies that had uh, put up the slag heap. They took Terry and Jim at gunpoint and said that they had been trespassing on posted land. It was private property. They weren't allowed to do it. Jim and Terry told me later that they were convinced that what had happened was that they were followed in by men who put up posts after they had gone by and uh, thus made it seem that they had uh, trespassed on posted territory. Anyway, eventually, uh, the state police were brought in. Terry and Jim stayed in this uh, coal company, prisoners of the coal company, till about, uh, oh, I don't know, they must have been there about 12 hours or so until finally pressure from our headquarters in New York sprung them. And uh, they got out. They told that story. They told the story of being held prisoner in West Virginia by the coal company. It was on our evening news broadcast, as were several other stories about the plight of the people in West Virginia. Just about a week ago, a man that they had met down in West Virginia came into my office with Jim, and a little while later, Jim had to leave to do something else, and this fellow said to me, he says, Dick, he said, do you know what it is to be without hope? And he was looking at me with enormous eyes, and I said, I've never really been that way myself. And he says, well, he said, I know what it's like. And he said, I know that the people of West Virginia in that mining territory there around Buffalo Creek were absolutely without hope. They had no hope at all. And then he said, Jimmy and Terry, they came in there and they told those stories and they didn't care. He said he didn't care if they got the shit kicked at them or anything like that. They, they, were, they didn't care what kind of guns were pointing at them. They just refused to uh, knuckle under and they continued to act with integrity. And he says, now these people they, out there, he said, they have a little bit of hope. They have a little bit of of faith. They have a little bit of suspicion that maybe, maybe because Terry and Jim cared about them, that uh, something good may eventually happen in their lives. Uh, Terry and, and Jim are still doing stories about West Virginia and uh, other places. In particular, West Virginia, and, and some more of them are going to be coming out in the very near future. That's not especially the point. What I, what I really wanted to do now is just give you a little bit of an introduction into the kind of, the kind of things that, that cross your path when you're in this business and when you're in the particular post that I am. You never really know what your decision at any given moment is going to mean eventually to your, uh, to your broadcast to the integrity of your program, to what the viewers throughout the country see. It, uh, it also uh, illustrates in a, in a very small way that there is no telling when your day ends and when your day doesn't end. And I would now like to give you a little bit of a, of a view of what one day, one day's broadcast amounted to in the uh, production of the evening news. That day was last Friday. It was September 14th. The big story was uh, Chile, of course. The coup occurred on Tuesday, last Tuesday. By Friday, we still hadn't gotten any film out. The censorship was, was extreme. The microwave facility by which we might have satellited out of uh, Chile had been destroyed during the first day. And uh, 
nobody in the outside world had seen anything from Chile. We had sent that first day a crew similar to the one that went to Buffalo Creek. This time it was Charlie Murphy as a correspondent, went from, from Miami. He had been there several times. Phil Bergman, a producer from New York, who also had been there several times. Henry Lilac, a film editor from New York, and a camera crew that we have used uh, repeatedly from Argentina. The cameraman's name is Jorge Casaburi. Uh, that day, I got to work about quarter to 10, which is the time I generally uh, get in. And about 10 minutes later, I was told that, that somehow or another word had just come out from Chile itself that Channel 13 in Santiago was going to uh, come forth with a satellite film uh, transmission. It was supposed to last 70 minutes, so we, and it was supposed to start at 10.30. So the first thing to do then was to make sure that we had tape machines, videotape machines, to record the feed. The second thing to do was to call Bergman, uh, the producer in Buenos Aires, uh, they went to Buenos Aires because they couldn't get into uh, Santiago, and Murphy to see if they knew what, the, what was going to be on the transmission, what we could expect. Uh, they didn't know. They hadn't heard. They, there were reports that CBS was claiming that this was their exclusive film, that they had paid $50,000 for it and nobody else was entitled to it. Uh, $50,000 is a lot of money for any one story, even a story as big as Chile. Uh, we really couldn't confirm those reports, so we didn't pay any attention to them. And uh, we took in that transmission, and it, it went on for about 10 minutes. And the pictures, it started out with uh, two earnest-looking gentlemen sitting in a studio, dressed uh, very austerely, talking to us in Spanish. Uh, their studios were in the Catholic University in Santiago, which was the headquarters for the, uh, for the television station. And they very soberly, in Spanish, said that they wanted the rest of the world to see these pictures of the coup that led to the overthrow of President Allende. They said that they wanted it to be seen in Peru, the United States, and Canada, in Europe. They wanted the whole world to see. Then they started the film, and you really didn't see very much. You saw a bunch of people standing around. You saw a, a, a little smoke coming out of a building. And uh, you saw a couple cars at the end of a street. And uh, then uh, you suddenly were aware that somebody else was speaking in the background very, very dimly. You could hear somebody else speaking about liberty and people and, and how the people's liberty is what really mattered. And a few minutes after that, the transmission suddenly stopped. Not that we weren't seeing a picture from Santiago, but we didn't see any more film. What we saw then were, were dancing girls doing a ballet, and we heard classical music. And uh, we, we subsequently heard from uh, uh, Charlie Murphy in, in uh, Buenos Aires that he had heard that that voice that we had been hearing was the voice of Allende, the last time he had broadcast to the nation. And that when the military junta leaders heard this voice, they immediately stopped transmission of that film. Whether or not that actually is what happened, I have no idea to this day. So we figured possibly, maybe, uh, the transmission might be resumed again, but we had no, I, no way of knowing for sure. So just to make sure, we, we kept somebody standing by and videotape. We made sure that we had tape machines for the rest of the day, somebody standing there. We made phone calls to everybody we could imagine uh, that could be called. We called our stringer. Stringer cameraman in uh, Santiago, a fellow by the name of Leopoldo Correo. Uh, we hadn't heard from him from the first moment of the coup. We had no idea where he was. We understood somehow or another that he wasn't where he was supposed to be, so we thought that might be a good sign, that he might have been trying to get out film to the United States somehow. Anyway, we, we couldn't find out anything from anybody. Uh, about whether the transmission might start up again. So we figured, well, we're going to have to live with what we've already gotten, which will at least be a little bit of a picture of uh, what went on that day when Allende was overthrown. So we talked to Murphy and told him uh, he had seen the pictures also. We told him how we were going to edit it, and we told him that he should give us a uh, phone feed 
of a, uh, of a narration, and I guess it was at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So he said, okay, he would do that. <coughs> then we proceeded to figure out what to do with the rest of the, uh, with the, rest of the uh, show. Um, I should back up a little here now and say that ordinarily, uh, instead of being told that I'm going to get a, a transmission from Chile in half an hour, uh, when I come in in the morning, I'm greeted with something that looks like this. It's uh, the morning, it's the overnight situationer, which runs to about uh, 10 pages of, uh, of itemization of all stories that are being covered all over the world by ABC uh, crews or by uh, some foreign crews, stringer crews, uh, crews of affiliated stations throughout the states or, or uh, ABC crews uh, anywhere. And uh, look through that and are able to tell what is happening in the world. And uh, <coughs> you know uh, every day that, that you are able to draw upon the resources of ABC bureaus uh, domestically uh, from Atlanta, from Chicago, um, Los Angeles, and uh, overseas from London, Paris, Bonn, Germany, Rome, Beirut, Tel Aviv, Nairobi, Hong Kong, uh, Tokyo, and Saigon. Uh, all, all stories that, that uh, are eventually, uh, ABC is a little different than, than other networks in that uh, the evening news with Reasoner and Smith is the only network news program that, uh, that we have, aside from a syndicated service that goes out to affiliates uh, throughout this country uh, every afternoon at uh, 5 o'clock uh, New York time. So everything that is done anywhere in the world is primarily done for the ABC Evening News, that is all of spot news. There is other material shot for the Reasoner Report, which is seen on Sundays, I mean Saturdays, and there are some documentary film production. But primarily the breaking news stories are all for the Evening News. That means that everything is covered, uh, has to be approved by the Evening News before it is, uh, it is filmed, unless you're, it's in a situation like Phnom Penh where a, a bomber comes over or somebody shoots a mortar at somebody, then obviously if there's somebody nearby, they'll go out and point a camera in that direction. But otherwise, everything funnels through in, in a situation which, as I say, is unique to the networks uh, at ABC, eventually to me. Uh, so, The thing that is up to us then every morning to do is to figure out what's going on throughout the world. We've gotten all this input, now what do we do with it? Um, you sort of have to approach it basically philosophically by saying to yourself that what my job is, is to organize the world in 28 minutes and 29 seconds of airtime, minus six minutes of commercials, for six million households throughout the nation. And uh, quite literally, that is what you do set about to do. You try to organize things as crisply and clearly and concisely as one can possibly do it. And as, as early in the day as you possibly can do that, the better off you are in terms of being able to go after the stories that you decide you ultimately are going after and also weeding out those stories that you realize after you've come to grips with all of the things that are available to you, weeding out those things that just aren't going to make it in that particular day. So again, unlike the other networks, we start a little earlier um, to organize the day to make out a lineup that will eventually be the lineup of stories that we will show in the evening news that night. Uh, the lineup is a piece of paper that looks like that, and it uh, itemizes very precisely the length and the subject of every single story that we're going to tell on the evening news that evening. 
Uh, sometimes we just have to leave blanks and, and, uh, and uh, blank amounts of time uh, because we can't figure out exactly what's going to happen at, at 1 o'clock, what's going to happen at 4 o'clock. So we will leave a space for a minute of assorted news, for instance. But uh, other than that, we, s we try to uh, put the day's news into a very, very precise focus so that we will be able to tell as we go along what we want to do. Besides that, again, unlike the other networks, we try to segment our news uh, by subject or, uh, well, by subject between commercials. Um, we will try to have as many related stories grouped together as possible and not follow, for instance, a story of a about Chile with a story about uh, the Chrysler strike. We'll try to break things up and have foreign news together, domestic news together, et cetera. So on this particular day, obviously the first section of the show was going to be devoted to um, the story from Chile. Other than that, on top of the very first section, of course, as those of you that are familiar with the broadcast, know that we have four headlines that Harry will tell every night, the four top stories of the day. And then Howard will read off a list of clickers, we call them, uh, six lines of, uh, of, of uh, visual material on the screen, which will tell viewers what correspondence he will be hearing from uh, and what the subjects of the reports will be throughout the course of the program. We feel that this helps to focus the news right away for the viewer. And uh, we feel that it makes for a clarity of uh, elucidation that uh, we feel is essential in, uh, in bringing, bringing the news every evening crisply and concisely to the viewers. So on this particular night, as I said, Chile was the top story. The second section, um, very obviously, very early in the day, it seemed as though it was going to uh, come down to uh, a series of things about the energy shortage, energy crisis. And there were several things uh, going that day, a lot of them revolving around the uh, gasoline shortage and shortages of petroleum. That particular day in Oklahoma City, there was a, uh, a shutdown of uh, gas stations that was rather widespread and had rather serious effects throughout the, uh, throughout the city. There was another place somewhere else in the country that had a similar thing happening. I don't know where it was, as a matter of fact, anymore. But as it turned out, there was nobody within reach that, that we could call, call on to go to that particular, that other city, so we had to rely on Oklahoma City. We didn't have any of our own folks there, so we had to go to the, to the local station, KOCO, and uh, rely on them for a report on what was happening. So we, in a series of phone calls, uh, did that. Uh, went after that story from them. Then we happened to have had uh, uh, shot just a few days before that uh, on the basis of, a, of an energy speech that Nixon had made uh, just the previous week, a story about the Elk Hills oil reserve a military oil reserve out in California that Nixon said might have to be tapped because this was really a serious emergency. So we had a story by Dick Shoemaker on that. That constituted the second segment and uh, then we, from that point on, went into a section which was economic. There was a story about, uh, the second day story that day about confusion over whether or not uh, the President really wanted to uh, institute a tax surcharge, and White House seemed to be talking out of both sides of its mouth, so we wanted to have a piece that would say just that. You can, so we had uh, Jerry Landay, one of our White House reporters, prepare a piece uh, about the confusion over the possibility of a surtax. Next, there was a strike imminent in Chrysler. UAW was threatening to strike. This was Friday afternoon. It seemed as though they were going to strike at midnight that night. So we went to WXYZ, our station in uh, Detroit, 
sent a producer and a film editor there because we wanted to make sure that the quality was uh, network quality and sometimes you can't depend on local stations for network, qual network quality, so we sent people there. Then uh, the next section was uh, obviously going to be a foreign section. There were a fair amount of things happening in uh, Cambodia. They had just signed or initialed the uh, ultimate peace treaty in Laos. And besides, there was also a discussion of uh, Henry Kissinger's role in Cambodia on Capitol Hill and the hearings for Mr. Kissinger's uh, nomination as Secretary of State. So we lumped together two pieces, two film pieces in the next section, uh, one from Frank Mariano on the fall or the recapture of Kampong Cham, and one by Bob Clark on the Kissinger hearings in Washington. Then at the end of the broadcast, we always put together a section which we call People, Places, and Things, where we have uh, an assortment of news we very realistically came to the conclusion that there's no way that we can possibly um, relate everything to everything in all of our sections. So at that last segment, we have kind of a, a potpourri, potpourri of uh, assorted stories, which we call People, Places, and Things, and then we try to end it up with an interesting film piece. And this particular day, we had a film piece about John Connolly. He was protesting he was not a candidate for anything. He didn't want to be vice president. He didn't want to be president, but he was running around making five speeches in two days in, in the Chicago area, and he was obviously running for something. So we had a piece that said that. Then the last segment is always devoted to a commentary on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. It's, uh, it's uh, Howard K. Smith. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's uh, uh, Harry Reasoner's turn. Uh, Howard has three because he was the first kid on the block. He got to ABC before Harry did. Um, I might add that, that uh, I'm not doing this all by myself, obviously, all during the course of the day. I have three senior producers in, in, uh, in New York who work under me, six associate producers, and uh, an assortment of other staff people, uh, two writers, six film editors, researchers. And in Washington, there's a similar staff, except that it's uh, a little smaller. It's also essential uh, in our broadcast, uh, and this is, again, we differ from the other networks in this respect. It's essential, as far as we are concerned, for clarity, to give as much assistance to the viewers as possible in understanding what's going on. So we give them some graphic reinforcement of Smith and Reasoner's words wherever possible by rear projection and chroma keying in behind Harry and Howard uh, sketches, what, uh, sketches that we call vises that represent the particular subject that they're talking about. And we try uh, again, by uh, a unity of design of these uh, visual elements to make a coherent uh, whole of uh, each particular section of the broadcast that we, uh, that we do. As much as possible, we try to have the visas prov provide a, a coherence as well as the subject matter itself providing that coherence. That also requires that we start working a little earlier, too, because we have a lot of work to do just to have these visas put together by our art department. Um, that should or could have been the, the end of the day in terms of putting the broadcast to, uh, together. However, most days don't go, go along without the change of, of the lineup in um, either dramatic or non-dramatic fashion. This particular day, there was a very dramatic uh, end to the evening. At about uh, 4.30, we heard that the people down in Chile said they wanted to broadcast to the world again. They wanted to tell the people of Peru and Canada and the United States and Europe and everything what was going on, and they had some more film. And again, we heard this was the film that CBS had paid $50,000 for, and we couldn't have it. <clears throat> so this time, again, we said, well, 
how do we know CBS paid $50,000 for it and, and it, it's really theirs? We have no way of knowing that, so we'll take it. Unfortunately, CBS at by this time had, had, had the foresight to place the down leg order, the order for the down leg of the satellite to the United States uh, in with the telephone company itself. And on the previous satellite, uh, we had placed uh, the order for the down leg, so we had, uh, we were sure we were going to be able to get it, and we said that the other networks could also have it. But in this case, the telephone company will not allow you to tap into the satellite feed if the network that has originated the feed says you can't do it. So CBS said, no, you can't have it. So we said, why not? And they said, because we paid $50,000 for it. But then, the next series of why not questions, the answers became a little different. And they started to sort of not quite contradict one another, but sort of act a little shifty. So we realized that something was really fishy here, and uh, we were just not going to take no for an answer. We told our uh, um, liaison with our engineering department that we didn't care what the telephone company said, that somehow or another somebody should, with, a, with his elbow, flick a switch or do something because we were determined to get that feed. Uh, about the feed was supposed to start at 5.30. At 5.26, uh, we placed another call to CBS and said, come on now, you've been vacillating, you've been telling us different stories, you've been unavailable to us, we're not sure that that satellite is really yours, can we have it? And they said yes. Mind you, at, at this point, we had half an hour before airtime because our first feed goes on at 6 o'clock. CBS and NBC don't have a feed until 6.30. So we had half an hour uh, to put together some sort of a package on Chile. Obviously, we couldn't call in Murphy and Bergman to do anything particularly from their end in Buenos Aires, but we did anyway because we thought they might know something that we didn't know. So all the while that the feed was on, we had somebody on the line on the telephone with them down there, figuring that somehow, magically, maybe it would make sense for them to, for Charlie to uh, feed us his uh, voice over the telephone, and we could record it and put it over, the, over this uh, tape that was coming in. Un unfortunately or fortunately, the magic didn't occur, and uh, so we put a, another voice on it. We had a correspondent in New York standing by, a fellow by the name of Gregory Jackson, who put a voice on it. Um, and we had a piece that ran about a minute and a half uh, for the six o'clock feed. It went all right, looked good. And uh, more material was still coming in all its time, so we, we added to the package, and Greg added to his narration. And by um, 6.30, we had about a three-minute package that uh, looked very, very good, and it had a coherence to it, and you, you really saw uh, some of the shooting, you saw tanks, you saw smoke coming from the presidential palace, saw, you saw people, crowds uh, at the end of the street being detained, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a highly professionally uh, put together package by our folks in videotape. And uh, for their shows uh, later on, well at 6.30 and, and 7 o'clock, NBC and CBS, of course, had basically the same thing. I, I say in all, uh, with all objectivity, that ours was a better package. Uh, you must always be objective. Um, so that was that day. Uh, one closing thing to say, um, throughout all of that battle over whether or not we were going to be able to have the right to use that uh, satellite 
stuff from Chile. We were the ones that were doing battle with uh, CBS, and NBC was, was not. They were sort of sitting on the sidelines seeing how it was all going to come out. And uh, that's the way things have been very often in recent days. Um, I think it's generally conceded in the network news business that right now CBS and ABC are the people that are battling it out uh, most often in the forefront uh, against one another. And um, we started way back with uh, fewer stations because we came into the business later than, than either CBS or NBC did. And consequently, with fewer stations, our ratings were much lower. Also, we spent less money on uh, news than they did then. We didn't have the attractive anchor people that we now have. <coughs> And uh, so we were way behind, but in the last four years, uh, we have uh, made tremendous strides so that right now, the latest national Nielsen rating sweep uh, had CBS roughly at about 26% of the share of the audience, NBC 25, and we were about 24. So it's uh, basically a very much a three-way uh, scrap, and it's a very exciting scrap to be involved in. It's uh, sometimes quite exhausting, but it's also uh, an awful lot of fun. Recording for posterity proceedings of the evening. So we would appreciate it if you have a question, step up to one of the microphones. There's one on either side and one in the center aisle. That way you're easy to see and easy to be recognized and then we can keep a record of what, what the answer is in response to. All right? There's somebody in the basement of the White House who will be recording the uh, <laughs> thing, so <laughs> just speak right up. I have a question. You haven't said too much about what uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Reasoner contribute to the preparation of the evening news. Would you say something about that? Yeah, the, I'll repeat the question in case people didn't hear it. The question was, I haven't said much about what uh, Harry and Howard contribute to the, uh, to the show. Um, I was asked that question this afternoon by a, a group of students that I met with uh, shortly after I arrived. Uh, the situation is, is such that, uh, of course, Harry and Howard write their commentaries. Uh, and they keep current with the news throughout the course of the day, every day, all the time. Uh, over and above that, they, they have a whole series of commitments uh, Harry, for instance, is, uh, has to put in work on the Reasoner Report, that Saturday half-hour thing, which is almost exclusively his. And they have a lot of uh, other demands on their time, both in and out of the network, that precludes their getting involved on a, an hour-by-hour -hour basis with the daily news program. Although I said that they do keep current, and very often will ask to write a particular story. Most of the other things are written for them by, uh, by two writers in Washington and two writers in New York. Also, it's a situation where uh, before I even got my job, for instance, uh, I knew that I was supposed to get it, but I had to wait to be told that I was supposed to get it until Harry and Howard could be consulted to see if they felt that I should get it also. So, in other words, they have to have faith in me and in the rest of the people that uh, are working for them. Uh, and uh, because they do have faith, they sit back and uh, figure that the program will come out all right. However, if at any point they disagree with anything that is uh, being done, uh, neither one of them is particularly bashful, and they will uh, make sure that, uh, that I'm told. And sometimes if I don't respond, then they start grousing to somebody else on the staff, 
And uh, sometimes, I must confess, uh, I just sort of pretend that I didn't hear what they said because uh, sometimes they're, they're basing their complaints on uh, incomplete information or what I perceive as a particular prejudice of theirs. And, uh, but generally, it's a, uh, it's a happy kind of uh, consensus that, that does work out the, the broadcast throughout the course of the day. They're very easy to work with, and, and as I say, if they feel strongly about something, it, you know, we'll probably do something about it. Another question? Dick, I wonder if I could ask you a question about uh, in your system of operation, in which you seem to have much more direct control of content, uh, that, that particular contrast with NBC and CBS. We've always understood, for example, that Walter Cronkite had a great deal more to do with the content of his show than may be the case with the other two networks. Would that be true? Yeah, I think so. And, and uh, CBS, for instance, uh, because Cronkite uh, calls himself a managing editor of his broadcast in addition to being the anchor man. will come in late in the afternoon, for instance, and shake up the program and uh, tends to uh, give a, uh, lend an air of uncertainty to many aspects of the program in terms of production technique as a result. Uh, it's, it would be totally impossible for CBS to uh, to do the kind of graphic representation that we do with Cronkite running in the last minute and shuffling pages and throwing things out and tossing things up in the air. And uh, I don't think that, uh, personally, I don't think that much is gained by, uh, by, his, uh, by his doing that uh, at, at a late hour in the day because the change in emphasis that you can affect at that late time, which is generally, as I understand it, when, when he would be inclined to do that, uh, generally can't be very much because most you certainly can't suddenly have a new film piece materialize from out of nowhere uh, if you haven't been covering it and he felt you should have been covering it. So uh, the, uh, I, I think that our system is, uh, is a pretty efficient one in terms of, uh, of tight control over over what's going on uh, all the way. Yes. No, I was asked uh, earlier, well, first of all, uh, I'll answer the first part of the question. I think that FCC uh, licensing regulations uh, probably do inhibit local stations. And uh, I suppose <coughs> by their being inhibited, some of the things that they do not cover, consequently, are not covered by anybody, and so that there is a diminution of uh, of knowledge that's, that's about in the land as a result. I, I don't feel that the, uh, that the FCC has a direct uh, influence on, on what we put on uh, or in our decisions on, on any given night, however. Uh, but there is no question that, that, uh, that I think that if I were a local station manager, I would be aware of the FCC uh, and the possibility that it could do something uh, about my license. Uh, as far as uh, guidelines from uh, ABC management, uh, there aren't any. Uh, there, there are the obvious, well, there are some to the, to the de I'll amend that to say there are some that we, to this degree, that we will not stage anything, we will not fake. There was a uh, the uh, Senate 
Now that one of the House uh, Commerce Subcommittees held hearings uh, over the last year sometime about fakery and uh, staging in uh, broadcast uh, journalism, television news. And uh, we had a, a rule all along anyway that nobody should stage anything in terms of filming a, uh, filming a, uh, a report. And if anything was not exactly as it might have been happening naturally, and we filmed it in this unnatural state, we would tell people that this was a specially arranged demonstration for ABC News. So we, and at the time of the subcommittee hearings, we were, these rules were re-emphasized and, and uh, redistributed re to the staff, but those are the only uh, restrictions uh, other than the, the normal restrictions of uh, decency and fair play, et cetera, that, uh, and objectivity that, uh, and libel that everybody has to, uh, has to adhere to. <coughs> I was asked this question earlier also uh, in connection with the Agnew speech a couple years ago about how that affected, uh, about how th how that affected our coverage. And I must say that, that it certainly made you think about your objectivity uh, about what you were doing, but I can't consciously say that uh, I made any decision following that speech that I would not have made prior to that speech. And also, I was not aware of any uh, influence being brought to bear on me by any of my superiors at the network. It may be that one of them or several of them were pressured by the White House or by some other people in the administration but if they were, they had the good sense and the courage not to pass that along to me in the trenches. Uh, during the uh, last presidential campaign, for instance, it was very, very difficult to uh, give a semblance of fairness or equal time to the two candidates because uh, Nixon just didn't campaign. And uh, sometimes I was sort of concerned about that because I sort of would have liked to have had the other side on once in a while. Uh, but by the same token, uh, whenever McGovern would say anything that I felt ought to be said and, and was a uh, major news story or an interesting story for some reason or another, he put it on regardless of the number of hours uh, more McGovern time we had on the air than Nixon, Nixon time. Yes. Could you give me instant replay, but perhaps on another camera? I thought you said that you met at 10 o'clock every morning to decide what news you would order shot by film camera crews. Is that correct? No, uh, not, not entirely. I might have been unclear at that time. Uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, you would, you would come in and you would read all of the material that was available to you. And uh, you would, uh, at that point, start weeding out and winnowing out and trying to figure out where you were at. And uh, decisions as to what you were going to shoot any given day uh, are made over a 24-hour period, really. For instance, every night before I go to bed, I call the assignment desk and talk to them about what's coming up the next day, what I want to sign, what I don't want to sign. And all through the day, you're making these decisions in consultation with our assignment desk, who then implement what, what, uh, what you want to have done to me a certain rigidity and lack of flexibility. Do you make any use of uh, feeds from your affiliate stations? Do you make any use of videotape rather than film? Do you ever uh, uh, uncover unexpected film footage from volunteers who happen to shoot a killing or a riot or something of that nature? I'm still yeah, troubled we by what yeah. the yeah. careful pre-planning I admire, but surely you must have oh, some sure, degree of flexibility. Sure. Well, we, we sometimes uh, uh, change the lineup five or six times a day. And, uh, well, just in this one uh, broadcast, for instance, that I described, we had uh, material from two affiliates, for instance. And um, we'll, we'll change uh, even when we're on the air. Uh, we'll, if something happens, uh, we'll just swing with that and, and change our whole thing all around the place. 
and uh, we use film, videotape, anything that, uh, that is required. There, the formula is, um, is, is a rigid one uh, within which uh, you can have maximum flexibility. It's, it's just that the formula is a set formula that uh, you can do anything within. Yeah, I think it'd be uh, criminal, as a matter of fact, uh, to decide at one o'clock in the afternoon that uh, the lead story is going to be such and such, and uh, then have something happen at five after one and not pay any attention to it. Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, it's it's um, in the case of Smith, it'll be read by um, the producer in Washington, and uh, then it'll be sent up to New York on a Thermofax machine, <laughs> and I will read it, and then it will go up to uh, a senior vice president who will look at it, and uh, it's just pretty much a pro forma thing. Um, I can. I can remember. Uh, I can remember. I guess only about two cases of uh, of any objections being made to a commentary by anybody, and that was uh, not when Smith or Reasoner were doing it. And occasionally there'll be f errors of fact, for instance, or a phrase will be uh, sort of mixed up or a little convoluted or something. So we'll suggest changes like that. But there is there there is a check on what they say so that we're not surprised when they say we should declare war or something, you know. They're pretty good. They, they know what they can say and what they can't say. And they're not told what they can't say. But I mean it's, it's just a sense of, of uh, the, the boundaries uh, within which any columnist really works, you know. Yes? Uh, because it was uh, felt that Reasoner would uh, be a more attractive co-anchor person, and uh, it was an unusual opportunity to get somebody who was, uh, in effect, a, a superstar to, to battle for preeminence with the other networks. It'd be, um, it'd be very awkward. Uh, NBC, would it, it would be a production nightmare, it would be impossible. NBC had sort of a rotating anchor thing a couple of years ago where they were using six people sort of interchangeably and you couldn't figure out where they were at. But two people is a nice balance, three would be too many. Yes. Um, I suppose on the on the uh, on the staffs in, in New York and Washington, just the plain editorial side of the thing, there would be about sixty people. Uh, that's including artists <coughs> and film editors, and then of course uh, out in the field you have innumerable people, cameramen and correspondents and producers. But those are just people uh, inside, and then that's that's also not including the the studio cameramen who actually uh, are behind the cameras in the studio when Smith and Reeser are on the air. Yes? Being as you are in a very competitive um, situation with the two other networks, do you ever find yourself rejecting a very newsworthy story because it doesn't contain enough entertainment value? Uh, that's, a, that's a difficult uh, thing to uh, to answer one of the things that that you that you have to do is is uh, have a balance of uh, of news that is all that is not only uh, important but also does have a certain uh, interest factor in it so consequently if you would have uh, Henry Kissinger, for instance, uh, well, he, Kissinger's not a good example, I guess, because generally whenever Kissinger gets up to say anything, it's kind of unusual, and uh, the chances are you got to have it on the air. Uh, but he takes too long to say it. I wish he would talk faster. <laughs> uh, 
there is there is there is a factor of uh, of of interest that you have to pay attention to. Yes, and that you do. I find myself consciously saying during the course of a day, uh, looking at a lineup and saying to myself, "Well, we have nothing but talking heads looking out at us." You know, Senate is saying something or correspondent saying something. And if we can only have a piece of, of uh, interesting film to leaven this, great. So how you really get around that is by making sure that you keep ahead of the news in the sense that you uh, pre-plan. We have about 50 stories on the shelf on our, in our film bank that are all very viable stories that are just waiting to be pulled out uh, to be used in connection with some particular news peg. And so by having those kind of things available, you're not locked into the dullness or a lack of dullness of any one particular day necessarily. For instance, this uh, Shoemaker piece <coughs> from Elk Hills was something that had been done about two days before and it was saved just for this occasion. Preparation is done in a case where you may have a public figure who is suffering from a disease. I think back to when Johnson died. Uh, at the time I was watching NBC, I'm sorry. But uh, they, in about 10 minutes, had a special right on there, right after the news, on Lyndon Johnson. How much foresight is uh, done in planning something like that where there might be a sudden death in the case of a public official? Yeah, well, we have a, um, a program prepared on Nixon, for instance, that is designed to go uh, should he resign? <laughs> and we're very actively working on Agnew now. <laughs> in, the, in the case of uh, Lyndon Johnson, <coughs> I was mentioning that earlier today, as a matter of fact, uh, we got a, we were on the air at that day. It, it was a very funny situation. I wasn't an executive producer yet then. But the, the fellow who was executive producer then has a young wife whose 30th birthday happened to be that day. And uh, he decided for some reason or another that he should give a formal dinner party to celebrate her 30th birthday. So he left early to see about the formal dinner party. And I was going to sneak out a little couple day, couple minutes early so I could get into my full dress suit and all that kind of business too, when suddenly there's a telephone call and one of the associate producers picks up the phone and somebody says to him, we'd like to give you a death notice. Can you take it? And he says, death notice? What are you talking about? So she said, I'm calling for Tom Johnson in Austin, Texas. And he says, Tom Johnson, because he knew that Tom Johnson was Lyndon Johnson's uh, press guy. So he said, put Tom on the phone. So then Tom said, uh, the president has just died. So we were in the middle of our 630 feet at that particular time. And so I got word to the control room right away that uh, Johnson had died and they should uh, just immediately uh, ditch the rest of the broadcast and uh, just let Howard and Harry talk for the remaining 12 minutes or something about Johnson. Fortunately, both of them knew enough Lyndon Johnson stories to make that some of the most fascinating television you'll ever want to see or hear. It was really marvelous, a marvelous, civilized, literate uh, exchange. Then by 7 o'clock, we had pulled off the shelf our little mini orbit of Johnson, which ran, I don't know, five or six minutes, and rearranged the, the rest of the show, keeping in the two-way uh, discussion that had been taped as it went by the previous time. And uh, so in effect, we had a half an hour on Lyndon Johnson with just about no notice and uh, improvised. Then we redid the program subsequently for the West Coast, which uh, goes on the air 8.30 New York time. But uh, ideally, you should have uh, prepared bios on, uh, on all presidents and vice presidents and things that you care about. I can't think of any. <laughs> yes. On on uh, on Tom on the call from Tom Johnson. Uh, 
Yeah, it, there was, uh, I forget exactly uh, what other factors uh, were involved at the time, but we knew very, very quickly, AP and UP came through within minutes after that, and there was a, uh, there was something implicit in the phone call, I, I don't remember what it was anymore, that, that made it, uh, that made us uh, sure that it was, uh, was the true story. That could be a problem, though, I grant you. <laughs> yes. The first question was, why are there three feeds when the other ones, uh, other networks only do two? And the second part of the question was, what can I tell you about the ABC uh, weekend news? The first part of the, the, uh, the answer to the first part of that question is the, um, we would love to be able to do away with the six o'clock feed because it would give us an extra half hour of time to do things. Uh, however, an awful lot of stations uh, continue to want it, and it's, a, it's a s really a sufficiently large number of stations so that there is uh, resistance in the, in the uh, upper echelons of ABC News to, to uh, continue it. The weekend news is um, not as good as it should be. It's uh, 15 minutes on Saturday and Sunday, and it's uh, well, just because it's 15 minutes, it's not as good as it should be. It should be half an hour. And uh, eventually, there probably will be uh, uh, more news on the weekends, but when that's going to be, I don't know. ABC has committed itself, by the way, to a, uh, an increased uh, increase all along the line in terms of news presentations. And uh, we are committed to putting on a morning, some sort of a morning news uh, program five days a week. S before January 75, and uh, the, the emphasis is before January 75. Uh, also, documentaries are in for a big push this year. Uh, there are going to be 12 primetime uh, documentaries which have been promised to be hard-hitting and, and not just fluff, uh, basically investigative reporting uh, documentaries. Yes. The question is, how do you decide when to stop reporting about a specific event? For instance, Skylab, which is still going, and you heard about it for the first couple of weeks and then not after that. I think you have to figure on something like that, that uh, <coughs> basically when, when you're no longer interested in it yourself, like when, for instance, if I'm no longer interested in it, I, I figure that uh, the chances are that uh, most other people wouldn't be. And it, uh, it has to be, in that sense, there has to be some subjective judgment involved. And you can 